we have a couple more people joining us, um, but let's, let's get going while we wait for other people to join. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Jeff Butts. I'm the project manager um, with Boulder County and Multimodal Transportation Planner. And um, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, I'd also like to thank all the partners on this work with this presentation or work with this study. Um, of course, we have Boulder County. We also have the city and county of Broomfield. We have Longmont, Town of Erie, Lafayette, RTD, Fort Collins, Commuting Solutions, um, Federal Transit Administration, CDOT as well. So thank, thanks to all of our partners for helping us through the study. Um, this is the first public meeting of multiple that we are going to have. We have three public meetings planned for uh, this study. Uh, this one, we are going to talk mostly about visions and values and existing conditions. Uh, I would also encourage you to join the next one that we are going to do. The next public meeting sometime in the spring-ish will be about alternatives. And that's usually the fun part. Uh, you get to see sort of what we're looking at and talk about different options and different um, uh, real solutions there. So that's, that's fun. So I just encourage you to uh, stay in the loop on this project and join the next one as well. Something else I just wanted to mention is that this is all in English, um, but we are also reaching out to the Spanish speaking community. Uh, we're trying to do it through a little bit of a different method um, through networks and reaching and sort of a smaller Smart level we found in the past, these maybe don't always work um, entirely well for that. So trying, trying there too. And then something else I just wanted to uh, point out is that if you look at the bottom, we have a Q&A section. Um, and if the, you have any other comments, you can type your questions in there. Um, but if you have any comments as well, feel free to type those in there, such as, um, if you think, for example, maybe you want a trail to go alongside it, or maybe there's some sort of crossing um, that's difficult. If, if you have any of that type of stuff too, feel free to put that in the comments as well. So um, thank you all for joining. Um, and now I'm gonna pass it off uh, to Ed who will, with the consultant team who will explain um, some of the housekeeping stuff. Thanks, Jeff. As Jeff mentioned, my name is Ed Parks. I'm with the consulting team. I'm our uh, public outreach specialist for this uh, project. I just want to go over some housekeeping in terms of the virtual meeting format. Um, for those of you who haven't done this before, uh, this is a Zoom webinar. Um, the meeting is going to be recorded. The comments are going to be public record. You are going to be muted for most of this or for this meeting. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we'd love for you guys to ask questions throughout the presentation. There is a little Q&A button down there at the bottom. Uh, we'll be monitoring the questions. We'll be posing those back to Nick and Jeff at the end of the presentation. We do ask that you keep those comments, concerns, and questions as specific as possible and relevant to the project. Uh, I know this is a bit different being virtual. We're sorry we can't be this and doing this in person and talking to you physically there in a room, but you know, with COVID um, the way it is, this is this is the best we can put together. We're really happy you all attended and are here with us. Go to the next slide. So in terms of your webinar participation, as we've kind of mentioned a couple of times now, the bottom ribbon, if you haven't been using Zoom, it should have a little Q&A button there. You can press that, uh, you'll type your questions and yeah, we'll be monitoring that and hopefully that'll keep you um, keep us informed of what you're thinking and we'll monitor that for the Q&A at the end. We'd really like your input on this project. Um, you know, Jeff and I are really, and Nick, we're really keen on trying to get people involved and getting people's perspective on how you want to use 287 and looking at this study. So we have a project website. If you haven't been there, it's boco.org backslash 287 planning. Uh, there is a survey on the website. It went live today. It'll be live for a while. We wanna get your feedback on like what, how you use this corridor and that survey gives us the best option on how we can do that. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it off to back to Jeff and he's gonna go through a quick agenda and we're gonna move through the rest of the meeting. Great, thanks Ed, um, appreciate that. Um, so hopefully everyone's pretty acquainted with Zoom and feel free to answer, ask the questions. 
So I'm um, going to go through some introductions and then we'll go for a project overview, sort of what the scope of this project is that we're working on. Uh, the consultant team has been working diligently on an existing conditions report to see sort of what are the transit routes right now, what are the traffic patterns and other stuff. And then the visions and values is something that we're really interested in hearing from you all on. And then schedule and next steps. So we can go to the next slide. And um, the people you're gonna be hearing from, my name is Jeff Butts, as I mentioned, I'm Boulder County project manager on this. Um, we also have Kathleen Brackey here, um, Boulder County Deputy Director of Transportation Planning, and then Nick Vanderquack, who is the project manager on the AECOM side. So next one. And now I'll hand it off to Kathleen to give you an idea of the bigger picture. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff, it's, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Kathleen Brackey. I'm the Deputy Director for Community Planning and Permitting uh, with Boulder County, and um, I get to work with the Transportation Planning Team, and it's really exciting to be here tonight uh, kicking off the uh, US 287 corridor planning process with you all, and really appreciate you taking the time to um, learn more about the project and, and get involved with us, and as Jeff uh, mentioned earlier, to stay involved throughout the, the process with us. Um, I thought it might be helpful to just provide some of the context for the project and um, help answer the question, why US 287? Why are we working on this particular corridor in this time? And how does it connect to all of the other important uh, regional transportation initiatives that we're working on in Boulder County? So um, earlier this year, uh, Boulder County um, adopted a updated transportation master plan. And that really is intended to set the vision for uh, multimodal transportation um, throughout all of Boulder County. And when we talk about um, transportation, we really focus on how are we helping to move people and people who are driving, biking, taking transit, walking, using all modes of, of transportation. So it's really um, people-centered. And then how do we connect across um, Boulder County, all of the different communities, all of the um, trips and connections that people are trying to make? And then how are we connecting Boulder County to the broader region around us, the Denver Metro region and the communities to the east and the communities to the north? So there's a lot of um, um, important corridors that have been identified through Boulder County's transportation master plan. And that includes the US 287 corridor. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse moving on the, the screen or not, but um, the 287 corridor in, in my mind is, is particularly exciting because we've been working on the 119, uh, State Highway 119 corridor between Boulder and Longmont for many years. And also we've been working on Colorado 7 connecting Boulder um, to I-25 and beyond to Brighton. And when you start to lay out then those uh, two corridors and then the north-south corridor of US 287, it really starts to create that triangle of network um, connectivity and network mobility across um, Boulder County. And again, connecting with city and county of Broomfield and the other communities around us and all the way south to uh, US 36. And then thinking about that regional context, US 287 also connects us to our neighbors to the north. And we know many people are traveling along US 287 from Berthet and Loveland and Fort Collins, uh, traveling to and from uh, Larimer County and Southwest Weld in, to get into the Boulder County area as well as to connect into Denver. So this is a really exciting corridor for us and to look at uh, how is it working today? How is it envisioned to work into the future? And how do we um, serve those growing, um, what I call travel sheds or like a watershed, but a travel shed um, that is connecting all of our communities throughout Boulder County and beyond. Um, as we worked on our transportation master plan, um, we really um, were able to see that in the forecasting data around the, the um, trends in, in connectivity. And we know that this corridor is, plays an important role today and will continue to play an even more important role in the future. So we're excited to be here tonight to share this information. And we know that the vision for US 287 needs to come about through um, community input from uh, community members and through partnerships with all of the different agencies that Jeff mentioned are involved. So we're really excited to kick this off and to help build out this important leg of the triangle <laughs> to help serve um, Boulder County and beyond. So with that, I'll turn it back to Jeff. Okay, great. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, 
appreciate the bigger picture there and seeing how this fits in. And so now I would scale down a little bit uh, into the feasibility project overview and talk about this particular one. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, we are looking all the way up to Fort Collins and down into Denver. There are really two components of this that you can see in the map here. The blue component is what we're calling the BRT service connections, or that's really the operational component. Um, focused on one seat rides, um, Fort Collins and downtown Denver, but then the portion within Boulder County and Broomfield where we have a little bit more control over the um, right of way there. Um, <clears throat> we're looking at capital treatments in there, things that we can do, queue jumps or anything of that nature, um, stations area toolkit. There's a lot of things that we're going to get into tonight. Um, so we're looking at capital projects within the um, sort of golden area there or yellow and then also looking at existing services up to Fort Collins and down into Denver. Next slide please. And this feeds into multiple studies as Kathleen mentioned a little bit. The biggest one that really laid out this vision came from RTD and that was the Northwest Area Mobility Study. Now you can see off on the left that laid out all the BRT routes that helped bring about uh, uh, the Flatiron Flyer for example and then we have um, the planning environmental linkages study that was done on seven and then the transportation uh, master transportation plan for the city and county of Broomfield and then Longmont has a downtown master plan. Um, interesting dynamic with Longmont because it's both regional and then that's a place. Um, and then speaking of places, uh, 287, or excuse me, the State Highway 7 station area master plan. There's a portion of this where the two overlap where it's both 287 and 7. And then the Long Street or the Longmont Main Street corridor plan is another one that ties into this. And then a, the Boulder County Transportation Master Plan. So a lot of studying has been done to get to this point. Looking at um, the 287 corridor, um, right now there's 22 major and 16 minor stops with um, projected to have 9,000 daily boardings. Um, $56 million in capital costs was the estimate at the time, and then $7.2 million annually for operations and maintenance. A lot of these numbers are estimates right now, and they'll be more refined. The travel time right now is 32 minutes from Longmont to Broomfield, um, and that's really the estimate on the BRT travel time. And we're hoping to really get that up and see what we can do as far as some bus on shoulder, um, or other treatments. The bus on shoulder is what was recommended in the NAM study. So moving ahead there. So, um, this is the first phase of a multi-phase project. So in this phase, we're really focused on the vision. We're going to be laying out the existing conditions, looking at the feasibility of BRT versus maybe express service or some other stuff and see really what the BRT feasibility is and what the estimated cost would be, some conceptual designs, and then a cool area of the thing that I really like is the stationary toolkit. Hopefully that can be a little more universal and also useful right on the moment. Um, coming up later, um, after this one, we're thinking about a phase two um, where we're going to get more into the designs. The safety, safety is just critically important. Uh, Boulder County, we're striving towards vision zero. We want zero deaths on our roads in Boulder County. Um, we're also going to be looking at signals and intersections that the signals may be pulled out separately. Some of this is pretty loose still. Um, and then prioritization, how we move forward, uh, design, the environmental analysis for the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, it needs for federal funding, other funding options that we would have, and then implementation plan and so um, with that, I will hand it over to Nick, who is going to talk about um, the project, the BRT stuff with the consultant. So Nick. Thanks, Jeff. That's a great overview of the project. And uh, thanks for, for all that. Just to introduce myself again, I'm Nick Vanderquack. I'm with AECOM and we're the consultant team that's working on this project. Um, We've been doing quite a bit of work on the existing conditions and we're really excited to share some of that with you here. Uh, before we get started, uh, you know, I think we all sometimes in the transportation world think that everyone knows what BRT is, but sometimes just a baseline understanding is, is helpful. So I'm, I'm just gonna run through a couple slides here, uh, just kind of explain the concept a bit more so we all can talk, kind of talk the same language. So BRT is different than local bus service. Uh, it is faster um, with, with improvements you can add 
uh, efficiencies to make the bus uh, faster than the local bus service. It's, it's more reliable uh, because you aren't always caught in the congestion that you might be with the local route because of some of the improvements and it can move more people. Uh, so there, there's more, more room on the buses potentially, there's more buses out there potentially. Um, there's a lot of possibilities there. When you look at the difference between BRT and rail, uh, really with BRT, you can, you can achieve a lot of the same uh, travel goals that you can with rail um, with, with less cost. It's more cost effective um, and can you, move, you can move the same amount of people and create a similar experience. Um, it's flexible. Uh, you can put a route in and you can divert it somewhere else. So you can change that route, add to it in the future. Um, so that scalable aspect of it really makes it something that uh, makes it a lot easier to start making transit investments where they're needed and as things change to evolve with that. Often BRT projects, uh, when they get when they go online, they, they follow the, the same routes or similar routes to what local bus routes, successful local bus routes have already done. Um, they're often building upon the transit markets that's defined there. And so and it really connects uh, major regional destinations and people that live uh, near there so that they can travel around the corridor. In terms of the types of BRT transit improvements, it's BRT is typically defined as a combination of a number of elements um, that create this transit service. And so when we think about 287, um, I'm going to go through these. You may think that this make, some of these make a lot of sense and some of these make no sense. Um, these are kind of mix and match types improvements that when you combine a number of these together, you end up with better service and, uh, and move towards um, a, a high capacity transit route. So just to start going through them, the dedicated transit lanes uh, is one that you can kind of think of when a bus has its own lane uh, separate from the car travel lanes. So if the road's congested, the bus continues to move and kind of travels on its own there. Another area of typical improvement that you might do on a BRT route is off-board fare collection. And so that's either a ticket vending machine that's located near a bus stop so a customer can prepay and not delay the bus when they're boarding, um, or it may be cell phone payment or something like that. The way that people board buses, uh, so near level boarding, can really create a different experience and make it easier to board and faster to board. So having a bus kneel down or even having uh, bus stops uh, built up on a platform so that you can board onto the bus that way. Those are some possibilities on for BRT there. Uh, vehicle types and the branding of vehicles uh, is, is a big thing. And think of the Flatiron Flyer. It's, some, it's, it's branded that people know what that is. Um, they know where they're going when they see that bus, that it's not just a regular bus, it's a special bus that is running on that route. So those are ways that you can really enhance the bus along the corridor. And then lastly here, just looking at intersection improvements. So specifically at signals, um, you can build in things that prioritize buses going through. So they're not getting delayed, um, they're getting priority over other vehicles. Um, and then queue, things like queue jumps where you might build an extra lane or a diversion from a congested area to go around. Um, those are typical things that you could do at intersections. So as part of this feasibility study, we're really, we've got a kind of a blank slate. It's kind of the most creative part of, of a BRT planning project where you can really come in and say, hey, are, would this type of improvement work? What combination of things might work? And really kind of build that vision so that later stages of design can start to bring that to fruition. So with that, uh, we mentioned up front that we are going to be doing some polling throughout here, and hopefully we don't have any technical glitches. We'll get this across, but uh, Jeff is going to ask a series of questions throughout. We'll kind of kind of break up the talking here a bit. So I'm going to pass it off to Jeff, who's going to go over this part here. Yeah, great. Um, and so now you see you should have the poll were dropped up or shown up on your screen there asking, why are you interested in this study? And you can select multiple of them. Either you work along or near US 287, you live near the corridor, visit businesses, visit friends or family. Uh, maybe you just travel along the corridor to reach other destinations, or maybe you're just interested in the project, but you don't live on here. So if you could just take a couple of seconds here and answer your question, answer this, um, multiple choice, give it about 20 seconds or so. Fifteen. All right, let's get your final votes in. Four, three, two, one. Okay. 
You can see the results. All right, and we have quite a large variety here. A lot of people live along or near the corridor or work along it or visit businesses. Um, a, a lot of people travel on 287 to reach other destinations. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, we will take these results and uh, put them in with the rest of what we've been hearing and use it in our future analysis. So thank you all. Now I'll pass it back to Nick to continue the presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I think getting that real-time feedback is is helpful to us as we present. Uh, so that's great. Um, so I'm going to dive into the existing conditions. I just will say in advance, we have we've got a lot of data, a lot of really cool and interesting stuff. Um, we're we've been developing an existing conditions report that will be available on the website later this year, um, before the end of the year. Um, which will contain a lot more detail than we're even talking about tonight. Um, so I'm going to start talking about that's really important to understand the existing environment before you start making recommendations. And so that's kind of the major piece that we've been in so far. So just to revisit what, what Jeff had uh, said up front, uh, Fort Collins to Denver, it's a pretty long corridor. It's a pretty long space. Um, those service and, and connections to the north and to the south are really important when you look at where people are going and where your potential ridership riders might demand to go um, if you are providing better, better bus service. For the purposes of a lot of this analysis, we're looking at that core capital improvements area in Boulder County and Broomfield. Um, and so that map on the right shows that. And the, the main communities there are Broomfield, Lafayette, Erie, and Longmont. Um, and so as I go through this, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about, about those places in particular and also look at those regional connections. So is starting with corridor, corridor population density, um, really we're looking at about two miles around the corridor when we, we're coming up with these statistics. Um, and this is helping us to understand the potential ridership uh, that might be coming out of here. So there's, there's almost 150,000 people that live within two miles of this core area. And that breaks down to about 60,000 households. Um, the area in Longmont you see on the right here is the most concentrated piece where people live. That's the, the highest density of, of housing. Um, but there are people that live obviously in all the communities along the corridor. And it's helpful to understand where that is as we look at, at this process. So we're gonna jump back to another poll. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Jeff. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, now for this next poll, we're trying to get an idea of who who we're talking with. Normally we would be able to visit in person for a little while, so we're trying to make this a little interactive. So where do you live? Uh, Longmont, Erie, Lafayette, Louisville, Broomfield, Boulder, City of Boulder, that is, or unincorporated Boulder County, which would be anywhere, Larimer, Denver, some other place. If if you go with some other place, uh, if you could just type in the Q&A down below where you are, that'd be great. One choice and we'll give you maybe 15 more seconds or so to answer. Five more seconds, so get your final answers in. Two, one, and let's close the poll. All right, look at that. A lot of people in Longmont, Broomfield, unincorporated Boulder County, all the way down into Denver. All right, excellent. A lot of people along the corridor. So great. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, again, we'll use this in our analysis. So thank you. And I'll pass it back to Nick. Thank you. It's always interesting to see how if that aligns with our, our data properly represented. Um, just looking a bit more into some of the details. Uh, we've kind of divided the population up a little bit as we're looking at uh, uh, what is the corridor makeup, uh, who, who's out there. Um, so one of the important things to understand, um, this corridor is diverse. Uh, and when looking at the, the racial breakdown, there's 16% of the people uh, there are Hispanic. Um, and as far as what languages people speak, 5% of the corridor speaks English less than very well. Uh, and so you, the map on the right is showing the, that percentage of people that speak English less than very well. Uh, a lot of that concentration is up in Longmont, and this becomes really important as we think about our engagement um, throughout the process of the project. As Jeff mentioned, we, we've got some Spanish-only engagement uh, upcoming. It also comes into play when we look at how we're designing in later phases, who's using 
the system and everybody uses things differently. And so this is just one of the things we think through um, when we're doing that. Uh, another another one of the elements of the population is the ages of people uh, and seniors are one segment of the population that can be more transit dependent, especially if they're unable to drive they're limited on mobility and so it becomes very important to have good, good transit service. Uh, the density of seniors varies throughout the corridor with the highest concentration in Longmont um, and about 14% of the corridor is in this age bracket. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, looking at high school and college age students, uh, there are uh, about 9% of the corridor is, fits in this category. A lot of, a lot of families um, with potentially some, some students at home or college students that are living alone. Uh, this is an important element to think about when you look at what colleges are located near this potential route or which high schools are there. It just becomes a, a viable way for people to start traveling when the right services are provided to them in ways that make sense. So it's an element we're looking at as far as uh, transit connections. One of the most common things people think of when they think of transit, especially with some of the existing service that's out there is connecting people, people with their jobs, um, commuting patterns. And so just a look at where the jobs are located of people that work on the corridor. This is that job location. Uh, Longmont has the highest, uh, Longmont and Broomfield both have about the same number of jobs, uh, but Longmonts are, are more concentrated um, it looks like near their main street there, um, fairly close to the corridor. Broomfield's got a lot of jobs, they're a little bit more spread out. And then Lafayette and Erie also have some jobs to add to this. When you start to think about it in a, a regional context, um, you can look at things a little different way. This, is, this, this yellow outline here is the study limits of what we're looking at. And this map shows people that are starting their commute and live along the corridor, where are they going? Um, and so you can see with the heat map here, there's a bunch of people that are going um, to Longmont, you know, from the quarter. Those are people that could potentially be picked up by a enhanced bus. Um, a lot of people go into Boulder. Um, this corridor is connected to other quarters that serve other potential planned quarters and existing bus routes that connect to Boulder. Um, but then there's a lot of people going to the south. Um, this compass here is showing the general movements of uh, people as they travel. Um, a lot of people going south down to downtown Denver and other places in the in the metro region. And then a lot of people going up to, as Kathleen was mentioning up front, a lot of people going to Loveland and Fort Collins. And that's why we've really expanded the reach, even though that area is, is really outside of the RTD service area, uh, transports up there and connecting, connecting in di the different services and thinking about things holistically in terms of what might work best is really one of the goals of this project as well. So vehicle ownership along the corridor is, uh, is the way we looked at this was to look at the number of people, number of households that don't own vehicles. So car free households, um, about 4.3% of the households that are within two miles of 287 along that core area don't have, uh, have zero vehicles. That's a little bit lower than the regional average. And it, it you know, maybe for a variety of reasons. Um, one of those is looking at the land, land uses surrounding there. It, it, it's difficult to not own a vehicle um, for a lot of trips that people need to make. Uh, so it might be pretty, it's hard for people to travel in those conditions. And, and so enhancing transit, enhancing other multimodal connections can start to change things where people are able to make a choice to not have a vehicle or people that don't have that choice and just can't afford a vehicle um, have the right travel choices that are made available to them. So with that, uh, you know, just wanted to understand a bit more about uh, who we're listening, who's listening today. So Jeff's going to go over another question with you. Hey, great. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate that. It's interesting to see where people work and what those travel patterns are. Again, that was all taken from cell phone, um, the pinging of the towers with Terralytics, uh, really regional. So um, where do you work? Where do you go to school? Um, Longmont, Erie, Lafayette, Louisville, Broomfield, City of Boulder, maybe unincorporated Boulder County or Larimer County maybe in Denver or some other place. Again, if you work some other place not on here, please put it down in the Q&A in the bottom so we can see. So um, I'll give you maybe 10 seconds here. And start closing up. Three, two, one. Okay, let's close the poll. And we have a lot of people working in Longmont and Broomfield. That aligns with the data. 
really well. It's almost amazing to see it align with the data so well. Um, so now I'll hand it back to Nick and he'll continue on. Thank you. So thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm gonna move on to some of the physical improvement or physical existing condition of the different modal networks that exist in Boulder, Boulder County. So starting with transit, we're gonna to talk to uh, vehicles and bikes as well. Uh, the transit network that's out there right now, this map shows the core routes on 287, the LX and the LD. Um, those are RTD routes that serve between Longmont and Broomfield and connect down into Denver. Uh, and then other intersecting routes within Boulder County. Uh, the transport connection, the flex connection that uh, has been talked about is that existing um, service that transport runs that connects to Longmont and Boulder all the way up to Fort Collins. Um, that uh, is an important link here. And then the other planned BRT routes that were part of the NAM study and were mentioned earlier on 119 State Highway 7 um, are, are critical to establishing that, that transit network that's, that works well for a lot of different people. Those RTD routes, uh, so we've got a lot of data on transit and it's really important stuff. Um, just to quickly give you a sneak preview here, this is the, the ridership information. Uh, important thing to note here is that the service that's being provided really the bigger circles shows that more people are using those stops um, so you look at Denver as be having some really big circles on the LD route um, and then every every town in between uh, you know, has some variation but obviously there's some some key locations within each of these towns that have those uh, that high number of ridership those are likely the locations that would be recommended in our study and we're still looking into this uh, but where the station locations would make a lot of sense, um, building upon that existing transit demand. The LX route, similar to the LD route, is uh, it connects Longmont to Denver in a more express way. Um, so we've also got some ridership information there. We've got information on all the routes that run through here, and we'll be including some of those into our existing conditions report. From a roadway perspective, understanding the way that traffic uh, the, the number of vehicles that are out there is important to understanding how people move around. So the quarter really varies uh, as far as from the northern end in Longmont. There's about 25,000 vehicles a day. Um, but if you go all the way down into Broomfield, that moves about doubles up to about 50,000 vehicles per, per day, depending on where you are. As part of our project, we're collecting more traffic data. That's really going to help us understand what kind of delay exists at intersections along the corridor. And those are really the, the kind of that low hanging fruit where potentially putting in some intersection related improvements might help to solve some of those issues to allow buses to get through that faster than they are right now. Uh, Boulder County is also in the process of updating their countywide crash, crash report. Uh, and that report dives into all the crashes that happen in the county. And it really looks, uh, as far as what this project is going to do with that, is really looking at those fatal crashes and those high injury crashes <clears throat> and making those areas that have an escalated attention as far as safety improvements and things that could be done, particularly when you look at intersections that have higher than normal crashes or crashes that involve bikes and pedestrians, um, vulnerable users where um, doing some different things could help to save some lives. That's really kind of the crux of what this data will be used for in our process. From a bike perspective, uh, there's a lot. This this map shows a kind of a zoomed out view that I wouldn't want to try and follow on my bike, um, but it does show a lot of the existing facilities that are located on 287 and connecting through 287. So to recap, there's you know a little over half a mile of bike lanes in Longmont. Um, that's the only location on the core that currently has bike lanes. Uh, there's about just under two miles of shared use paths that are on 287. There's no shared use path that connects all the way through. So that may be one of those places where there aren't a lot of people bicycling on 287 because they don't have great facilities and there's a lot of traffic. Uh, as far as intersecting bike routes, trails, uh, there's 14 uh, as you go from throughout the corridor that cross 287 including the planned uh, proposed RTD rail trail that uh, is being studied right now uh, to create these new east-west connections. Uh, those are really important when you look at how do they cross 287? Do they cross near a stop? Um, those can really help to enhance the ways that people get to the, the bus stop locations. How the, that first and last mile of how people travel, if they're able to take a bike on one of these connections, that really makes it a viable choice. 
So we've got another polling question. So Jeff, take it away. Great, thanks, Nick. And yeah, as we're talking about uh, multimodal and a part of the study is setting that vision, uh, we'd like to know how do you travel US 287? Multiple choice, uh, drive a vehicle and motor ride a motorcycle, take transit, uh, ride a bike for transport or ride a bike for recreation, maybe a carpool or ride with others that includes Uber or Lyft or walk or some other way. I mean, maybe you hoverboard. Um, and so it's a multiple choice there. So take maybe 15 more seconds or so. Let you all fill in there. All right, we a few more, finish it up here. Five, four, three, two. All right, and let's close the, see the results. All right, everybody drives. Some people ride motorcycle, transit, and carpooling. Quite, quite a large mix, and so that just really shows the importance of um, having the real multimodal. So thanks, I'll turn it back over to Nick. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so, so Jeff hinted at Terralytics data. It was really it's a, a piece that we're analyzing, um, looking at where people are traveling using their, their cell phone data. It's all anonymous, uh, but it's really telling. And so, just have a slide here that summarizes some of our initial observations. We've got a lot of detailed stuff that we're including um, when we look at ridership and how this all makes sense. A lot of people travel on 2D7 using in short trips. Um, really, the top destination of people starting their trip on 287 is ending up on 287 within the project corridor, which is great when you think about, hey, they might be able to use a bus if we had great service. Um, a lot of people are going elsewhere that to locations that aren't labeled on this map. Um, we've only, we're only looking at a few destinations here. Um, of the ones that are labeled here, uh, a lot of people are going to Boulder. It's not unexpected. Uh, downtown Denver, uh, Loveland, and Fort Collins are the next highest there. So it's really important as we look to those north and south connections to really um, build upon where people are traveling and build that service to to work for people that need to make those trips. Okay, so part of the way that we wanted to organize uh, some of this information and some of this data um, in a way that cr creates a framework for how we are structuring the BRT feasibility assessment and recommendations is to divide the quarter up into character zones really the purpose of this is <clears throat> so that we can organize those potential and appropriate BRT treatments. So as part of this, we looked at a couple of things and I'll go through this fairly quick here, but uh, the existing roadway layout, um, do, does the road have sidewalks, parking, on-street parking, turn lanes or a median, um, whether that's a, a built up median or a center turn lane median. Um, the right of way was another variable going into this, how much space is available between the adjacent parcels. And then lastly, as you move through in and out of some of the communities, you go from a rural context into a suburban context, into an urban context and, and vary throughout. So those are all important as we think about building up this, this framework and structure. Um, the existing roadway layout, so uh, these, we'll call, we call these cross sections as well, is shown on this map. Um, there's some similarities between some locations. Um, for instance, the physical median and sidewalks. Um, the north part of Longmont and Broomfield have that similar cross section or existing roadway layout. Uh, Longmont on either end of downtown has two way turn lanes and sidewalks, about three and a half miles of, of the corridor is located in that space. And then of course, downtown Longmont is pretty unique. Um, it has the only section that has a physical median sidewalks and on street parking. And then we've got this long stretch of rural corridor that's got a two way turn lane and a shoulder. And then the stretch that goes through Lafayette quite a bit is a physical median with a shoulder. How much space is available? This variable, we've got three different categories. We've got narrow roadway, we've got moderate roadway, and we've got wide roadway. <clears throat> so this gets pretty detailed, uh, but it really is helpful when you think about what could fit. Um, could a, a path fit within your available space? Could an extra, uh, extra wide shoulder that a bus could run on fit? Those will come into when we come to the recommendations. And then the general land use characteristics. So this is showing what I was explaining earlier as you transition from urban to suburban to rural. And so those all build together into this framework that we've established. This will be spelled out in our in our report, but just to kind of, we wanted to give you guys helpful to understand 
how this is building up and how we're moving forward. And so you can, we wanted to explain this to you so you could be part of that process. And so uh, that ends our existing conditions piece. Um, as I mentioned, lots of data. Uh, the important piece, another important piece of this process early on is, is really getting a vision defined and coming up to coming with consensus on values, especially when there's so many stakeholders and so many people involved with, with varying opinions and different things that you, they think should happen. And so we've come up with a series of value statements and Jeff's gonna go over these things with you. Um, we've been working with the stakeholder working group, which we talked about earlier, which is really um, a representative from each of the stakeholder groups, a professional planner representative that uh, is meeting to make sure that we're meeting the needs of, of all the stakeholders, um, you know, in addition to uh, the public meetings that we're having so we can get that proper input. So I'm going to pass it over to Jeff, who's going to go through those in a bit more detail. Yeah, great. Thanks, Nick. And thanks for explaining um, the process for trying to think about how we can um, frame the recommendations in an area that will be applicable to different areas, maybe. So this is an important part of this um, meeting today. We really want to know um, are we getting these right? And we're going to have a poll come up at the end of this, but I'm going to read through these. Just like you to ask, are we missing anything? Uh, do we have this right? Um, prioritize moving people over the number of vehicles. So that's right from our transportation master plan. Focus on frequency of buses during peak hours over the span throughout the day. So maybe we can have 15 minute, uh, a bus every 15 minutes that maybe runs a little bit shorter. Uh, leverage BRT integration with economic development opportunities. Um, you know, is there opportunities for maybe transit oriented development or some way to bring in development? Um, maximize transfer opportunities within existing regional transit, um, integrating into that network. And then also prioritize the one seat rides from high ridership destinations and origins. Uh, improve safety and mobility provide bus service that competes with car times. Right now, I believe it said the travel is like 39 minutes. So should we try to get this down to 39 minutes or shorter or maybe add additional stops? Um, these are things to think about. Uh, contribute significantly to greenhouse gas reduction and VMT or vehicle miles travel reduction. So mitigating global warming. Uh, offer better amenities at bus stations, bus stops, um, and more comfortable walking. So it feels more natural, like you're welcome there. And so look these over, and now we're going to put up the poll. We're going to ask you, uh, did we get this right, yes or no? And uh, if there's something missing, uh, please put it in the Q&A down below. So um, anything else you think we would need. So have we captured the value statements correctly, yes or no? Leave it here for maybe 10 more seconds or so. Okay, in three, two, one. We'll close the poll and let's see what others say. And the results show 93% say yes, one person says no. And what I see is that um, there was a comment about affordability that was included in here. Um, so thank you. That's a, that's a real great thing uh, to think about. So thank you. Thank you for including that. Um, I will now turn it back to Nick to wrap things up here. That's great. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, we take it very seriously to make sure that we're incorporating the comments that we get from people. We want to reflect the values of people that are going to be using this this corridor and live here and um, so thank you for any of the comments that you give here we do have just to remind you we do have a project website or that is boco.org 287 planning that is going to be all for this project we're going to have all of our resources um, a recording of this meeting is going to go up there for others to watch who aren't able to attend today um, and then any other projects um, items that we're going through are going to be located there so Right now at the top of the screen, uh, if you go there is a link to the survey that was mentioned up front. Again, if you can go ahead, I know that we've asked some of the same questions today, but there's more detail here. If you can go in and do that, even if it's right after this meeting, so you don't forget, um, that'd be very helpful. It's gonna be open for 
for a little while here, but we really want to get some feedback and we're going to be pushing that link out to others um, via the website and social media channels as well. Uh, we really want to know, did we get it right? Yeah, we want to know if, if what we're putting together here reflects what, what you're thinking as well. And as we move forward um, into the next phases of, of meetings, um, I'll pull up the schedule here. Um, as we look into the uh, specific BRT feasibility assessment, which we're working on right now, um, what improve, specific improvements make sense in outlining that a bit further. Uh, we're going to have a lot more need for feedback from, from everybody. And so we want, we want you to attend our meetings uh, in the future uh, coming up next spring um, when we look at presenting some of the routing alternatives and stop alternatives and the stations area toolkit. Um, we really would like to get a lot of your input in that process. And those will be worked into uh, from a feasibility report perspective uh, next summer uh, is where we'll be fin finalizing that. And uh, Boulder County will be taking this to the next next step of design after that, as Jeff was mentioning up front. So with that, I really uh, wanted to thank everybody. Uh, Jeff and I are on now, uh, available for questions, as is Kathleen and others from the project team. Um, if you haven't asked questions, um, please use the Q&A box. Um, Ed Parks uh, has been ma manning the station from the questions. so. Wanted to kick it over to Ed, see uh, if you could ask a, a few questions to the project team. Sure, and thank you, Nick, Jeff, for running us through the project there. That was really informative. Um, let's start off with one of the first ones we got in here was, how does the experience with BRT and US 36 inform this study? I guess I could take that. Um, or Kathleen could probably weigh in as well, but uh, a lot of these, the thing about 36 is it has the managed lanes on the inside of it, and then it also has uh, the operations that are for the buses. The buses come more frequently, and then you have the trail alongside of it. And so that really set the multimodal vision. And so I think that is really sort of the schnelling point, to use a word. Uh, that we're looking at. And so that's sort of the baseline. When we get over to 119 as well, we've also copied a pretty similar one. And so I would say that it is uh, certainly um, a big thing to look at. Um, each corridor is different, but um, it, it's definitely inspiring and a guide. Did yeah, you have something, Kathleen? Yeah, yeah, I could ahead, piggyback Kathleen. on that a little bit too. I think it's a great question because really when we think about, again, the Northwest region, and including all of our, our communities in, in Boulder County and City and County Broomfield and, and others, the US 36 is definitely a model. And all of the work that went on to that process to not only design the infrastructure to support the bus rapid transit or the Flatiron Flyer um, service that's out there today, as well as the commuter bikeway, um, that was such an important part of that corridor to create that um, uh, experience for people so that you can use all modes of transportation. And the bikeway along US 36 has been a very important part of that corridor. And that also helps inform the work we're doing on US 287. It's important to have that regional bikeway that can complement the regional bus rapid transit. A lot of people on US 36 use the bikeway to access the um, Flatiron Flyer stations, for example, or to travel from the Flatiron Flyer station to their um, home or to where they work or go to school. So it's a really great in um, identifying the corridors for all throughout the Northwest Area Mobility Study. So US 287 as well as 119 and Colorado 7. So thanks for asking that question. Thank you, Jeff and Kathleen. I think uh, another building off of the comment you had there, Kathleen, on the background for the bikeway, uh, we had a question if we were gonna consider bikeways on this or a bike path on this corridor as part of our study. Maybe Nick, do you want to address that one? I can start and then have Ed, uh, Jeff jump in. Yeah, I think really we want to start with an open mind, open slate, um, looking at what's needed here, uh, not just automatically jumping to BRT as a solution for everything. And so our primary purpose of what we're doing is to look at the feasibility of BRT, but looking also thinking about those connections to stations those are really important when you think about a successful transit line you need to have people 
feel comfortable getting there. And that could be a park and ride, that could be people walking up that live adjacent to, to the areas, or that could be someone biking two miles to get to uh, a transit station so that they can take the bus into Denver. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, pieces there that, uh, you know, it's important to think from a multi multi perspective. Uh, I think from a, from a, from a bike perspective, uh, there's a lot of great roads in Boulder County um, as, as far as recreational biking. Um, and when you compare some of those to what 287 is like right now, there's a reason why a lot of people don't ride it. It's not, it's not comfortable. There's not facilities. So, uh, you know, I think there's going to need to be more study after this um, that leads into some, some great ideas and, and designs, but uh, we're keeping kind of a comprehensive viewpoint right at this point. And I'll just add on to that, that we've been hearing that quite a bit um, to look at bikes. And so this first phase is really setting that multimodal vision. And then we're going to move forward into secondary phase and future phases. And um, we've been hearing that is very important and it, it would make sense. And so um, it's definitely something that is being closely looked at. And again, we have 36 that has the bikeway. We have 119 that has the bikeway. And so we're trying to build a network there. Um, yeah. Get back guys. to now. Um, so another question here, this is a good one. Um, have the near and long-term impacts of COVID on the use of public transportation been factored into this plan? Maybe Nick, you can address that with some of the traffic analysis that you talked about on some of those slides. Yeah, that's a great question. And if we had a a magic answer to knowing what the future looks like, that would be amazing. Um, I think what we can do as part, and what we do as part of all, all of our planning is to make the best um, decisions about what you think the future is going to be like, uh, to use those the forecasting tools that make most sense. Um, as far as existing conditions and what, the work we've done so far, we're really, really trying to set a baseline as pre-COVID in terms of not having data that's um, abnormal. Um, but in reality, uh, we all know that working from home, we're all at home right now. Uh, it's changing habits that even post COVID will still be changed. And so um, as this progresses, um, adding to the scenarios that we're looking at, having um, alternating realities about what travel patterns, patterns end up looking like and what transit looks like in that environment is, is really important to really being open-minded about kind of the, the variations of where we could end up. So Jeff, I don't know if you had other thoughts on that that piece or, or Kathleen. And I guess I'll just say, yeah, COVID's certainly a black swan event. Um, we were looking at the existing data from 2019 traffic patterns. And um, right now we're also starting to do counts, for example, to see what COVID has, how what that impact has been. Um, there's positives and negatives. And uh, it's certainly a factor, but no one knows, no one really knows the future, but we can create it. I'll give it to Kathleen. She has more to add. Thanks, thanks Jeff. And, and you're right. I mean, that's always the challenge of planning, right? On, in any time is we all wish we had a crystal ball and could see into the future. So um, certainly thinking about, you know, where we are today, what are the, um, the lessons learned that we've all experienced through the, the hard times and challenges of, of COVID-19 and the impacts of of the pandemic on our uh, communities, on our families, on our, our work, and certainly how we travel or if we travel. So I, I think taking all of that into consideration is really important. And we've had a lot of conversation around that at, at the county around how do we take the, um, I'll call them the silver linings from these hard times and use them to help inform the future going forward. And so um, oftentimes I refer to it as how do we bounce forward? It's not about how we go back to the, where we were in the past, but it's how do we come through this and how do we go forward and how do we leverage our experiences and the things that, that we're learning. And I think that you know, certainly transit has been very challenging during these times, but we know that our economy is, is coming back and it's, it, we've got to work really hard to make that happen. But as our economy is coming back and getting stronger, uh, transportation for people of use it, traveling everywhere again for jobs for for shopping for essential services and care um, we need to be able to provide these travel options and choices 
And oftentimes transit is not a luxury, it's a requirement. It's a, a basic necessity that people rely on every day. And we need to find ways to make it better, more safe, more reliable, more convenient and more affordable for people. So um, I'm convinced that we can use the time that we're in to learn and to bounce forward and figure out how do we provide a better multimodal future for people traveling along this corridor and again, connecting everywhere everyone's trying to go. The, uh, polling data was really helpful to see tonight around how people use the corridor. So it's, it's hard. We're in a rough time. It's going to be probably a rough winter, but I think that going forward, we're going to be able to create a new future and a better future for this corridor as well as others. So that's a, a great question. So thank you for asking. Right. I think we got enough time for maybe one more question here. I want to be respectful of everybody's time on a Thursday evening here. Um, Jeff, maybe you can help us understand some of the, the funding. Uh, one of the questions was, how might this uh, BRT corridor be funded? Is it from counties, municipalities, or is it a combination? Maybe you just kind of go into some of the background and how that's going to happen and moving forward. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and before we wrap up here, I just want to say, um, let's keep the conversation going. You see our email addresses on there. So feel free to email with anything. Um, funding is always a question and it's always a very important question. I think we are looking at a uh, combination of sources for this. Um, if we look at the way other corridors have been funded, they've been funded with uh, local funds, with regional funds, um, with uh, federal funds, maybe some state funds. And so at this point, uh, we are really setting the vision. We are looking at potential modeling to see how we can get the best service. And after that, we will begin to look at how we fund it and where that comes from. And um, yeah, exploring options will definitely be a part of the studies going forward. I don't know if Kathleen or Nick have anything you'd like to add to that or if we want to try and get one more question in. Yeah, let's try to get another question and that was a great answer, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Um, this is a very long question. Uh, <laughs> so one of our attendees is saying that having reviewed the traffic data accident uh, for 119 Highway 7, there is a shocking volume of injury accidents and fatalities during the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. window. Uh, he's very concerned about high-speed bus and high-frequency bus will be a disaster combined with the massive industrial waste facility the county is trying to advance at an unsignalized T intersection between Lookout Road and 52 for heavy truck, trucks and semis. How is this project influencing your plans? Seems like another conflict. I'll take that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I saw that comment and um, it's important. Uh, safety is the number one thing that we want and Boulder County takes it very seriously. Uh, we have a vision zero policy. We have a vision zero team. Um, we're working on a report right now. It is the most important aspect. I cannot just stress that enough. It's the most important thing. If something's gonna be dangerous, we're not gonna do it, period. Um, there are always uh, conflicts. There are always different um, goals that you want to have, and not all of the goals always align. We had initially wanted to put safety in this portion of the study. Um, we thought that safety was so important that we are pulling it out to um, a second phase just to make sure that when we look at these recommendations and what the transit services can be at say a, a peak service uh, the highest quality or whatever we can get and it may include queue jumps and signal stuff um, we then want to come back in when our next phase and focus a lot on the safety look at the crashes look at all the conflicts that happen between car to car and car to bus and bus to car and people walking and people bicycling um, so that is paramount and we have put that into a second phase just because it is so important. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, we're at 6.30 now. So 
Hope that answers your question. If you want to talk some more, here's my email address, jbutts at bouldercounty.org. I'm happy to talk more about it. So pass it back, Nick, to wrap things up. Yeah, I would just state that I think we got through a lot of the questions, but there's a few that maybe we didn't quite get answers to. I will state that we're going to summarize all those and give written responses um, and keep that on the project website as, a, as an archive of questions that were asked. And so um, if, if, you, if your question didn't get asked, that will be forthcoming. Uh, with all the information we put together. So thanks again, everyone. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, it's really important for us to have people uh, paying attention and this project is really important. We're really excited to, to bring it forward and uh, for joining. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye.